Well, hello again, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, you're in the zone, and yes, I am up close and personal. Like this today's episode, it well review episode of my show that is of the awesome new show on Netflix, which is Luke Cage. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is out, and is the hype is real? Well, I'm gonna tell you this now. Yes, the hype is real. Mike, Co- I mean Mike Coulter. Does an amazing, I mean, not me, no, I'll take that back, not amazing, but uh, pretty much a definitive version of that is Luke Cage. Like, while him is like, that's no Luke Cage, he is that Luke Cage. Like, oh shit, it's Luke Cage, Luke Cage. And he made, he just pretty much killed the show, he took it away, he took it home. But he had help, meaning the supportive characters and villains all did an amazingly perfect job. And so many Easter eggs and so many. Pretty much name dropping here and there without telling you. That's pretty much my computer. And oh shit, I thought. Anyways, yes, that's pretty much my phone going off over here. Anyways, so by all stretch and purposes, and I mean purposes, you get an awesome show where you pretty much have to watch it ten times in a row. But let me just let me just pretty much digress everything. And before we get into this awesome, awesome review, I must say the following: I will not pronounce none of the actors' real names because I will just butcher the living shit out of them. So by all means, I will stick with the characters' lovely, awesome names. So in this case, let's kick things off with. Luke Cage's character, which, well, Mike, Mike Coulter's character, which is Luke Cage, but anyways, Luke Cage, you know he's invincible, in a sense, but you know he's still human, he gets that pretty much, like, I just want to be left alone, please leave me alone, this and that, but he's thrust into the limelight of crime fighting, you know, and so, we see him pretty much develop, and pretty much find out, like, he pretty much has to be a part of this job, because that's who he is now, because, with his wife, who's deceased wife, Reva, who, and by all means and purposes, uh, man, she makes a great um, um, plot device that keeps going more and more and more mysteries, more things need to be answered, and we still got more questions than answered within Luke Cage's past. And I love the flashbacks, where Luke Cage is pretty much, he's dehumanized. He's pretty much, he lost all hope when he went to prison, because he was framed for a crime he did not commit. But... You see how it plays out in the prison sense. I know I'm jumping all over the place. Is that you see him grow more as a, as a character that we know and love to this present day. And we see Luke Cage in prison. And Mike Coulter does an amazing job of playing off that character who does not give a fuck. But at the same notion, he's a character who does care. That's what Luke Cage does. He does care about people. He does care about their issues and problems. He can humanize their problems and get onto their level. This is why he's so charismatic and pretty much... He's a great leader, put it like that. And you can say he's like Captain America, which, by all means, he is like Captain America. He's like the urban Captain America. And so, I get into the all, I get into the unplot itself later on. But I just want to discuss, I just want to just talk about the characters. Like for example, Misty Knight and Claire of the Lovely Nightmares. I, what can I say that has not been said already? These lovely actresses do an amazingly perfect job to integrate and pretty much make chemistry between the main character and the surroundings of Harlem City. And Harlem, damn! I just love the setting. It makes it all lifelike. Like, somehow, this can be real. But it's not real. But Luke Cage, it makes everything feel realistic. than say, all comic bookish, Like how Daredevil is and how Jessica Jones is. And the supporting characters, I won't get too much into them because there's a lot of them, but they do play a significant role where they don't become supportive characters, but main characters that you have to follow and pay attention. And so all, all the other supporting characters in the end result have their just desserts or something more evil, something more clever or something more sad or traumatic. And we see it play in our eyes that, damn, that's kind of fucked up, that's kind of fucked up. And I know I'm going, again, what is this guy talking about? Again, I'm trying to digress how much awesome this fucking show is by pretty much going through layers. I already talked about Luke Cage just a little bit because it goes into the plot. But I want to focus more on the supportive characters and the villains, which are pretty much all wrapped into one nice package. But anyways, back to what I was saying from before. I know I, I pretty much ramble on a lot. Anyways, um, so the supportive characters become more um, an integrative um, set pieces within the plot that makes it more genuine and not like gimmicky or stereotypical or this and that because 
for people who are like, oh, the writing's this and that. Well, have you lived in an urban area before? Have you lived in the hood? Have you lived in Harlem? Have you lived up anywhere where urban activities talk like that? No? No? Okay, then shut the fuck up. Anyways. And so the supportive characters actually get more give a lot of backing for the villains. And so Cottonmouth, I love that man. Cottonmouth, I love the character. He's like Kingpin himself. He has the connections, he has the context, but you see what he's doing though. You see what he pretty much has, it's like a two-faced situation where he's, he's, he's pretty much an awful monster behind closed doors, but in the public light, he's trying to bring back Harlem to his glory days. But the evil and pretty much the gangster life, which he's trying to leave behind, always catches up because he was raised in that environment. And his cousin, Martha, I hope I say her name right, let me... Look, let me just find it out because I could say that character's name wrong. Give me a second because Alfred Wood. Oh, yeah. Martha, Martha, Maria. Oh, yeah, sorry. Maria, who was Cottonmouth's um, cousin. Oh, man, she was evil as hell. But you know, she was playing the game of politics, but also playing the, in the life of the thug life, pretty much the gangster life. And. My friends did not like her that much, but I think that's why her character was there. You don't like her that much, but you love watching what you love watching her. She's like Cersei's in Game of Thrones, and you pretty much you see her again back by Shades, who I liked as well. Shades has so much mystery, and also he's a very clever character where he can pretty much get out of any tight situation and come out on top always, which I liked about that character. And so Shades and Mario both play off each other so great that I want to see more of these two characters. You might think she's still in charge, but it's really Shades. Shades is pretty much still in charge at the end of the day when the se when the season is already over. It's like, damn, son, that's crazy. But their, their, their goals are not really too far apart. They're pretty much in line with Cottonmouth, but Cottonmouth... He was pretty much too up in the mix with Luke Cage because I was messing with his business and his psyche. Because in, in uh, Cottonmouth's mind, the neighborhood was thinking of Luke Cage as the hero than Cottonmouth was. So it kind of pretty much struck a, a raw nerve with him because he wants to get rid of Luke Cage. But he's not going to really admit to the fact that um, what he's building is a corrupted empire. But an empire he's trying to support within, in, in the neighborhood of Harlem. So, it's a pretty much a catch-22 for him. And you see it crumble, and how he ends, well, his life, that is, how his life ends, is very fitting. It's pretty much the person he pretty much loves, but also he hates at times. It's his cousin, Maria. And that moment itself, how she pretty much killed him, I kind of felt bad for Maria. Because Cottonmouth and her grew up together, but... Cottonmouth didn't know the other side that was going on behind his back with his uncle and Maria and there's just so much going there I can't really tell you it because you have to watch that scene because it is beautifully done beautifully beautifully done and so in a fit of rage she killed him because she never asked for that and we tell a victim who has been abused or raped or any of that nature, and you tell they deserved it due to what they do, or dress, or whatever, or their nature, or their culture, then you're a pretty shitty person for going that route. And that would trigger, well, I won't, I won't say all people, but certain people trigger moments where they pretty much will attack the fucking life out of you. <laughs> and so, how it all ended it is pretty much was a fitting and pretty much perfect ending for how Cottonmouth would go out. And it was pretty much different too, because you always see the hero like, pretty much killed the bad guy. But in this sense, it's the bad guys killing off the bad guys due to a traumatic childhood. Which, from all reasons, all of our superheroes in the Netflix series has a traumatic childhood. No, I take that back. Every single hero in Marvel has a traumatic childhood. Like from Captain America, and then there was Thor, then there was Iron Man, damn. Then it was Black Widow, the Hulk. Hmm, that's a lot of motherfuckers. Anyways, back to my whole show itself. I just drifted off a little bit. So, how it plays off from that point gets even more better. Like, yes, Cottonmouth was a great character, but his he, he I didn't think he should be long. He should be in that whole thirteen arc at all. He should be in sixteen arc from the looks of things because he was losing. He was losing his grip with reality and also his power and money with the people he who he has contacts with. And so in comes Diamond back. 
And let me say this now. I love that villain. He made me laugh so hard. Bulletproof niggas are the or are cops' worst nightmares. <laughs> I couldn't help but laugh. It was just <laughs> it was great though. But also he outsmarted Luke Cage several times, where he had um, all types of weapons that can actually penetrate his skin. That's pretty much unbreakable skin. So it's pretty much vibranium. But again, it's pretty much different elements too because it's heated up and blah de blah de blah. I'm not a scientist, moving on. So it was great seeing Luke Cage be on the run and being hunted by someone that he knew in his past. But when it goes even further with the dialogue itself, that Diamondback is actually Luke Cage's brother, all bets are off. It's like, oh shit, I, I didn't see that coming. Because Diamondback in the comic books wasn't Luke Cage's brother, it was actually just partners and best friends that he grew up in the hood and yada yada yada. And so, and it was over a woman though, but Reva wasn't a part of that whole situation between why Cotton, why Black, why, why um, Diamondback and Luke Cage were enemies. It was actually it was very deep family issues. It was like, damn, what kind of far can they go with this? Because the writing is very damn good. There's small details that you, you haven't noticed. That's why you had to see it so many times. It's like, oh shit, I didn't know that. So the writing on a wall was just fucking great. Some people say the hallway scene was like, eh, it was a little, it, it dragged on a little bit too long. For me, I understand why, but the same notion, Luke Cage is pretty much, he's unstoppable. He's like Captain America. So, those hallway scenes were not going to be long. They're going to be short because you're going against humans who have no real fight against super-powered people. And you see the Sokovia quarters play a big factor, too, within the Luke Cage's um, story arc. You don't see it abruptly, but you see in tra you see a lot of sprinkles of it, where the public is pretty much gearing up and more weapons to fight off people like pretty much like the Incredible Hulk, Thor, and Luke Cage, and so on and so forth. They're getting weapons off the streets from crazy mad criminals, like uh, again Diamondback or Hammer or anyone else in that factor, and they're not really taking the cautions of what's going to happen when you open up that door. What if criminals or Punisher get hold of these weapons? Yeah, I know, right? It's pretty much possible at this moment. And so, oh man, because when he gets to the last wire of the show, it's like, damn. Because Diamondback, he eggs him on, but also you see a, a beautiful flashback within a present day arc or a fight scene of Diamondback and Luke Cage. And damn, it was great. No, in fact, Luke, um, knowing the fact, mm, yeah, knowing the fact that, um, Diamondback's, um, costume was fucking stupid. I loved it. <laughs> it was so cheesy but awesome. And oh my god, the ending. There's so many things. I can't wait for Luke Cage's um, se Luke Cage season two because his brothers gonna become powerful too. He's gonna get see some more corrupted individuals. And pretty much Luke Cage, sad to say, he might won the he might won the battle, but he lost the war. But when Maria um, Maria pretty much rat that nigga out, and pretty much she got away with it, full blown. And you know how Misty was pretty much like. You know, she was fucking done with it. And we see this theme all the time. And I'm going to pretty much the plot itself now. Is where it is about a Luke Cage story, but it's more bigger than that. Where Marvel's heroes actually make a strong point. Where the Sokovia courts shouldn't be involved at all because it should be in this hero's hands. Because, no, in fact, they're not controlled or pretty much given orders by higher ups like in the government or the world courts or whatever or United Nations. It's like, yeah, because you're gonna get, they're gonna be like puppets to the government, where they say you can't do this, you can't do that, but you gotta go over here, here, here. But I don't want to, too fucking bad. But anyways, and then Luke Cage saw the system not working again. Ha ha ha, ha ha ha. And and I like how Misty was getting on Luke Cage's back, like, oh, that's not part of the system. Blah zy blah zy blah. Like how Foggy was telling uh, Matt Murdock. He said, yeah, I know that blah zy blah, but. There's some things that the law can't do, what a law can't breach. And this is what he's talking about. This is what Matt Murdock was saying. Like, you see cracks that um, smart smart criminals will exploit. And there's nothing the police can do about it. Good policemen can do about it. Because corruption is so deep within New York City. It's like, damn, son. Where you get that hot shit from? Where'd you get that? Whoa, 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 whoa. Anyways. And he talks about so many so, uh, social issues where the cops and um, police brutality and race relations. And because there's a really strong scene where a cop b 
beats the living hell out of a kid. And by the way, the kid is black, and also that cop who beat the living shit out of him is black as well. So if it was like, and also it was crazy that the um the people at the at the rallies with the Black Lives Matter rally, they never bring that up at all. But that moment, like, huh, that's kind of awkward and also true that some like some groups out there who want pretty much um, justice or against police brutality don't say the full full story like. This guy was black, and he attacked another black individual who was innocent in this and that. It's like, yeah, 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 yeah. But you see how Maria, uh, Maria was pretty much using that in her favor, and how Dimeback was pretty much made a great and perfect rift within people of Harlem. And his weapons are play, his weapons are going to play a bigger factor in the bigger end game when it comes to defenders, or maybe Iron Fist, or maybe um, Luke Cage um, season two. Because what Dimeback did, he opened the door. Where the civilians who had no idea what to do opened it and walked in it. And he pretty much closed the door right behind him because he knows there's no going back. And so, so many awesome characters again. We see a lot. Um, we saw Wilson Fisk's lawyer. And also, um, I can't remember that guy's name. The other um, attorney. He's a D, he's a district attorney now. Um, Tower? Tower? District attorney Tower? I can't remember his name. But the mayor and Maria pretty much had like some talks behind closed doors how they were they going to use the weapons and you see the police pretty much understand that this was a setup against Luke Cage but in the same notion they were dragging their fucking feet just to get to this point and when it comes like this uh, one is um um what was trying to think? when um when a key witness is dead and they want to wait they want to blame Misty Knight again I can't really blame blame them for blame Misty Knight because she got her killed but the same notion you know that was um, all um, Maria's doing and it was just so fucking annoying. It's like, <sighs> and this is why the heroes don't like going to the police or pretty much going outside the rim because they want to see nobody hurt. But it's the same notion, the police drag their fucking feet so long. It's like, <sighs> fuck it. And there's just so much more. And yes, I was hoping that Missy Knight would lose her arm so she can get that golden, that golden bionic arm. But Again, that could be down the road soon. I hope it will be soon. Or pretty much an Iron Fist or Luke Cage or Defenders. Because she will be in the Defenders, which I can't really wait for that shit either. <sighs> There's just so many good nooks and crannies. And you thought, Isaiah, we just supposed to talk about the plot? Well, the plot, I can't really tell you the plot. Because, no fact, I don't care about spoilers. And some people don't care about spoilers. You should really watch this show because the plot gets very complex and very, very, very good. And... It's not a typical comic story. So by all means, that's how it was. And also, there's a cool cameo. I can't tell you either. Like, you have to really watch that scene. You see, you see a cameo. And also, there's Stan Lee cameo, too. But anyways. And as always, always, folks, do keep it locked, loaded, and very warm for me. Because I'll be back with more interesting reviews and gameplay videos and other cool knickknacks and shit. Because you like my show. No, you don't. Because I, that's me. And also, you're going to wonder, like, wait a minute, did he just change different spots? Yes, I did. Because I, someone was calling my name and everything else in that nature. So I had to go see who, who was that. And here's this cruel, cruel, cruel and editing of me saying my outro. Because that is me. Ha ha ha. And as always, folks, do keep it locked. It'll be very warm for me because I'll be back.